The next thing for me to talk about is my coat. Now, this coat would have started its life as uh, an issue regimental coat. Uh, the, the coats issued in the, uh, during the 18th century were much longer than, than perhaps uh, coats issued later. They tended to come down to round about the knee. Um, and they, had, they were folded back and had long tails at the back. And these tails were, again, very impractical. Uh, as you can see around you, lots of trees, there's lots of undergrowth. Um, that undergrowth will snag on pretty much anything that's hanging down. So those tails became quite impractical. They get in the way, if they get wet, they're heavy, and so the coat needed to be modified. General Wolfe and Lord Amherst ordered their men to cut their coats down, and what that meant was they took the regimental coat and they cut the skirts away, leaving a much shorter jacket. They also ordered them to remove the, uh, the, the, the sleeves from the coats and replace them with these short wings. Now these wings provide a degree of protection over the shoulder, they'll maybe deflect some of the rain, so if it does, you know, if you do get wet, uh, it means it's less likely to come straight down in through the seam of uh, where the sleeve is, I'll show you the sleeve is in a second. Um, but at the same time, it makes it much easier to take the coat off quickly, so it's much less of an encumbrance. This is a much more practical item of clothing, it's much more comfortable than the uh, issued uh, regimental coat. And as I said earlier, the wool that you cut away when you take away the, uh, the skirt of the coat could be used for a variety of things. Firstly, you might use it to put the wings on. They were also used to wrap water bottles uh, or to make um, perhaps fatigue hats, which are fabric hats that soldiers wore when they were off duty. Um, and so you can use that for a range of things as well. But that's my coat, which is a uh, heavily modified and much more practical item of clothes. Below my coat, I have uh, two waist belts. Now the first waist belt carries a belly box. This is uh, a wooden block uh, with holes drilled in um, which provides uh, some more ammunition carriage. So I can carry what, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 20, 40, 40, 40. 18 rounds in there. So I have 80, uh, 21 cartridges in my um, main ammunition pouch. I can then carry 18 more in my belly box and then as much loose ball and powder uh, as my pockets and powder horn can hold. So. This is another uh, way of carrying um, ammunition. And this is just carried on a, a, another simple black leather belt. Below that I have my uh, issued waist belt. This was, uh, these belts were issued again to all soldiers and would traditionally have been used to carry um, a hanger, which is a short sword and a bayonet. However, in line with the orders that were issued by General Wolfe, Lord Amherst, uh, I've got rid of my hanger, I've got rid of my bayonet and I've replaced them with a hatchet. This hatchet is a, a small light axe and as you can imagine it's much more practical in this kind of terrain. Uh, I can use it for a range of camp chores, uh, it can also be used as a weapon if necessary and so a much more practical item. And again this is protected with a, uh, a leather um, shroud or cover uh, which protects the blade which is very sharp obviously and it also protects my hands uh, and my legs when I'm moving. So that's a very sensible modification. The next item for me to talk about is my waistcoat. Now, it's a fairly simple item of kit, but the main modification that's been made is I've taken the sleeves from my regimental coat and I've fitted them to the shoulders of the waistcoat. What this does is it creates a fairly simple short uh, jacket or coat um, for soldiers to wear. Uh, again, this is actually a very practical modification because not only does it not have the, the, the skirts and so on of the, the regimental coat, which means that I can wear this, I can move around the woods uh, without any extra encumbrance, it also means that um, were I to just wear a waistcoat, then you know, I might get chilly because I haven't got sleeves. Uh, whereas now I have the warmth of the sleeves without the extra bulk of a main coat. Uh, in the orders uh, issued by um, General Wolfe and Lord Amherst, uh, they state that the reason for these modifications is so that uh, soldiers can shed their, their uh, regimental coats quickly and easily um, and continue to fight in their now sleeved waistcoats. Apart from my waistcoat, I wear uh, a pair of uh, blue wool breeches. These are in the, the blue of the Royal American Regiment. And then another modification that's been made is I've, I've got rid of the uh, gaiters or spatter dashes that were worn by um, regular soldiers or soldiers in line regiments, I should say, uh, and replaced them with a pair of wool uh, leggings. These leggings uh, imitated those worn by uh, the Native Americans. Um, the, Regular troops wore uh, heavy canvas gaiters which had uh, 
buttons down the side were quite difficult to get on and take off uh, and didn't really do a huge amount other than protect the, the stockings beneath. Whereas these uh, leggings, they're um, much more comfortable because they're made from wool, they're more breathable, and um, they're easy to take on, uh, take off, sorry, easy to put on, um, and they provide me with a lot of protection from bracken undergrowth and so on. Uh, so these are a very practical item of clothing and they're tied off with just a piece of red cloth. The, uh, the last two items I'm going to discuss in this video uh, are my shirt and my neck cloth. Now, uh, British soldiers at the time were issued a uh, white linen shirt which was closed to the neck by a neck stock which was a strip of fabric that held the shirt uh, tight around the collar. I have uh, discarded my neck stock and instead I've replaced it uh, with a neck cloth. This is simply a piece of um, black fabric uh, that I tie around my neck and it provides me with a little bit of protection from the elements, a little bit of comfort. Uh, and it's certainly more comfortable and more practical than uh, a, a slightly stiffer linen stock. I also uh, have replaced my white shirt which has, has worn out whilst uh, out on patrol or uh, uh, out on campaign. And I've replaced it with um, a civilian shirt. This is again made from linen uh, but it's a much more coarse linen uh, and it hasn't been bleached so it's retained its natural colour. Um, this kind of uh, adoption of civilian clothing uh, seems to have been fairly common among light infantry soldiers. And in clothing, I think, so, in closing, I think something for, for us to reflect on is uh, so the way that some of these light infantrymen saw themselves. Uh, they're described as having a very droll appearance and I think that perhaps uh, will help you to understand how different the uniforms and equipment of the light infantry were from their line counterparts. But even the men who used this equipment uh, thought that compared to their, their line uh, regiment comrades they actually looked droll, they looked funny. Uh, this was a huge departure from um, the way that soldiers dressed and the way that soldiers behaved. Their tactics were as different as their uniforms and equipment. And in many ways, they laid the groundwork for a lot of the tactical developments that would take place over the next 100, 200 years. When the British Army fought uh, against Napoleon in the peninsula, they had with them regiments of light infantry and regiments of riflemen who were men who were trained to be much more, uh, to show more initiative, to be much more adaptable, uh, and to fight in a way that perhaps some of the soldiers of the light infantry of the French and Indian War would recognise. Even today, uh, the rules for ranging that were laid down by Robert Rogers and would have formed part of the training of uh, British light infantry during the Seven Years' War, during the French and Indian War, appear uh, on the wall of training establishments used by the American Army Rangers. Uh, and so the legacy of these light infantry, their Ranger counterparts, is being felt even today. I think I'm going to wrap it up there. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope it's interesting and I hope you've learned something. Uh, if you'd like any more information, we do have other videos of particular interest. Having seen this might be our video on dressing the red coat, uh, which you can find on our YouTube channel. If you have any thoughts, any questions, uh, please do feel free to comment uh, on this video. And if you have any interest in uh, anything to do with reenacting, to do with living history, and in particular to do with the, uh, the French and Indian War, um, please do feel free to contact me. I'll also put the details of uh, our group's website. We're part of New France, Old England, uh, a living history society focused on the Seven Years' War. Um, if you'd like to know anything more about them, I'll put the link to our page uh, in the comment section below. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching. This has been The 60th Presents. Take care.